Good morning, Chairman Lang and the members of the European Parliament. It is an honor to be here today to represent Taiwan's Legislative Yuan, which consists of 113 elected legislators, including myself. First, on behalf of our government, I would like to thank you for initiating this momentum to build what may become a future bilateral investment agreement between Taiwan and the EU. My objective today is to let the audience understand three issues. First, what is Taiwan? Second, where are we going? And third, why is it in the EU's strategic interest to begin trade and investment formal relations? Next, Taiwan has a GDP of 723 billion euros and has a population of 23 million people. If Taiwan were a member of the EU, we would be the sixth largest economy and have the fifth largest population in the Union. Currently, over 50% of global cargo shipping passes through the Taiwan Straits, and we manufacture, as you all know, 60% of the world's semiconductors. As you can see, we are a key player in the global value chain, and we have a strategic Indo-Pacific region. To give you a sense of the diversity of our 23 million people, there are 15 Formosan languages spoken by percent of our population. Hokkien, Hakka, and Mandarin, and Chinese dialects spoken. And for our local elections, Taiwan is divided into six major cities and 16 counties. Just below is a local artist who recently asked ChatGPT to personify the characteristics of each of our cities. And I've included three illustrations below. The center one is Xinzhu, the city that you all know would be the home of Taiwan Semiconductor Group. Next slide. Taiwan has a long-term economic performance, which is strong and... As you could see from the cumulative MSCI index performance, the bottom is MSCI emerging markets. The middle is MSCI investable market index, which captures both developed markets and emerging markets, which consists of 99% of the global equity investable market set. And the top dark blue line is the Taiwan MSCI, which is clearly outperforming. Next slide. Taiwan's economic performance over the past five years has continued to grow, despite many of the global upheavals. The left-hand side is just to show you our economic resilience, and the right side is simply to point out that in these challenging times, faced with increased cost of living and the fight for natural resources, not all democratic nations like Taiwan, chose to stand with Ukraine. Next slide. Taiwan's current FDI situation is that our inbound FDI from the EU in 2002 is actually six times larger than our outbound FDI to the EU. What is worthy to note is that Taiwan has signed economic agreements with US and Singapore, the two countries who constitute 45% of our total outbound foreign direct investments. So perhaps a sectorial approach to collaboration in areas such as supply chain resilience, cybersecurity, and healthcare could be building blocks to what would pave way for an eventual bilateral investment agreement. Next slide. So what is new today is I'd like to share with you five new developments in Taiwan's legislative yuan that can help deepen relations with the EU. Next slide. Number one, the amendment of the Central Bank Act to create a sovereign wealth fund. Many of you may not know that Taiwan's foreign reserves is actually the fourth largest in the world after US, China, and Russia. It currently accounts for 623 billion US dollars. The proposal in parliament currently stands that 10% of this money would be set aside for a sovereign wealth fund, fully invested in overseas for pure financial gain and seeking long-term risk-adjusted returns. This main goal would be to increase savings and purchasing power parity of our government to help alleviate the financial burdens which things such as pensions and health care costs. Next slide. The second topic would be around Ch Taiwan becoming the third country in Asia to adopt GDPR. Taiwan can connect with democratic allies using interoperable standards by adopting GDPR domestically. Modifying our laws with the rights of our citizens, but also reduce the cost for companies seeking access in both our markets through the harmonization of legal standards. Number three, developing digital health to support an aging society. 
Taiwan did relatively well during COVID, but we need to capture all of applications through formal legislation. While we will be entering a super age economy in 2025, and with a shortage of labor and a vast landmass of 14,000 square miles, telehealth will be essential to mitigating the unequal distribution of medical resources. Next slide. Number of information for businesses and future generations. While our principle supportive of net zero by 2050, the reality is more challenging. We're helping address the pressures due to CBAM that would affect our manufacturing industry. This constitutes 3.7 billion US, uh, euros of exports in the EU listed on the table on the right. Also, renewable energy is now a quarter of our energy source. However, as a net importer of energy, the only way to be sustainable would be to reactivate nuclear power, which is a highly contested topic. And this is an area that many examples to share with Taiwan. Number five of EU standards of GDPR and CBAM is the other topic around the alignment of globes. As the Netherlands is currently the technology headquarters of Europe, so too can Taiwan achieve the similar, a similar status in Asia by in, in, adopting international tax standards. This is an example to merely show that there's still a lot of potential for Taiwan's growth. Next slide. Taiwan has signed 32 bilateral investment agreements and free trade agreements to Taiwan's economic and strategic importance and our reputation of being a trusted and reliable international partner. The most recent one was Vietnam 2019. Next slide. While tariffs are neither fashionable nor part of current negotiations for many countries, Taiwan, as a member of the WTO, is always open to discuss formal treaties with like-minded partners. Also note that the two illustrations here, U.S. and Canada, are working to formalize economic agreements with Taiwan, consistent to their One China policy. Decoupling from China is unrealistic, but de-risking is pragmatic. And finally, next slide. Thus, the EU can achieve greater strategic autonomy by formalizing its cooperation with Taiwan through a bilateral investment agreement or any of the other ideas I've put forth in my presentation today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ms. Wu. Uh, thanks a lot for this uh, comprehensive overview and also for respecting the eight minutes. Thanks a lot. Uh, Joanna. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to the event. Thank you for this is full presentation. Very interesting, and be happy to engage in discussion later on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, may I just be blunt to say that currently, as it stands, that there is simply a bilateral trade consultation between Taiwan and the EU. That is basically a B to B um, applies to B to B arrangements. But if you look at the foreign direct investment slide that I had provided earlier, the top two foreign direct investment outbound from Taiwan being the US and Singapore, which constitute 45% of our foreign direct investment. Those two have already entered formal G to G arrangements with Taiwan. And as I specified also, illustrated in one of my last slides in my presentation, there are now over 32 agreements from countries that have entered various formal G2G arrangements. So I would urge Parliament and the Commission to look into those for consideration because it is true that it is a delicate um, wire walking act um, to make sure that one respects the one China policy, but at the same time try to secure what is in one's um, strategic autonomy or strategic national interests. And for the average Taiwanese person, many people I talk to are shocked by the fact that the EU is the largest foreign direct investor in Taiwan. Most people, even journalists in Taiwan, have never heard of such a thing. Um, my husband is Belgian, so and I've lived in Europe. I worked in the city in London in banking. So you know, I understand the dynamics between Taiwan and Europe much more than the average person. Given this, the struggle between the battle of supremacy between U.S. and China, and that fact that Taiwan has culturally, historically been a colony of Japan, those 
three places play into people's minds a lot more than the EU. So I would urge that if EU does want to um, build um, more uh, connectivity with Taiwan, the only way is to look and explore the 32 um, con uh, arrangements um, that have been illustrated and to take forth from that that point. And in addition, of course, a lot of the areas that have been mentioned today as well through sectorial but government-to-government -government arrangements. And because I do not believe that what I'm hearing from Digi Trade about creative and open-mindedness um, is means targeted. Targeted is weak. Targeted will not speak to the, the businesses in Taiwan, and it needs to be much stronger in terms of a G2G agreement in some form. Thank you. Thank you, Claude. Joanna. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for all the questions. And um, they are m most of them are very difficult. I, I think there are no easy problems that we are discussing here today, and um, they are all very legitimate. And we have to handle the, those questions. We have to handle them in the Commission, as member states, and in the European Parliament. I think we have to acknowledge that this is a very complex exercise we are in, and. What guides our reflection is, I think, and that's what we converge, where we agree, is that we are all focused on enhancing our relations with Taiwan. But where we might differ is what it takes, what are we talking about in terms of content, and I repeat the word, what is the best mechanism. And um, this is, the debates like this actually very much help 